I'm Adam White, and welcome to another episode of Office Hours. Today we are joined by Don Davis, chairman and co-founder of the Professional Fighters League. Now, Don, you're a former real estate guy turned now MMA connoisseur. What the heck happened? I'm a venture capitalist minding my own business the day that UFC sold. And I had not been a big MMA fan. I'd been a huge sports fan yeah. and even a boxing fan. And I really had three thoughts reading the UFC press release material. First thought was, it told me there's 300 million MMA fans around the world. Third biggest fan base after soccer and basketball. It was news to me. That's, that's a lot of global fans. Number two, they had only been provided one kind of product, UFC. And in fact, there were only 30 fights a year from UFC. There's 6,000 basketball games. There's 9,000 soccer matches. So for that big audience base, they're only getting 30 fights a year really underserved. And then my third thought is, it had been a great entertainment product, but the definition of sport is meritocracy, win in advance. What if I could build a company that brought the true transparency and meritocracy to combat sports? So it could be like the NBA or the NFL, win in advance. And that's really what we've done with the Professional Fighters League. We started it that day to have a regular season playoffs and championship where fighters control their own destiny, win in advance. So I really view myself not as a matchmaker, <laughs> Um, Dana White's the best matchmaker in the world for the UFC, but I view myself as Adam Silver, which is he doesn't decide whether LeBron's going to be in the playoffs or not. Yeah. You win enough games, you make the playoffs, and you win in advance. In the Professional Fighters League, that's how it works. Fighters control their destiny. The best fighter each season is the champion in the weight class. And that's very, very different, whether it's boxing or MMA, and that's what we build at the PFL. Well, take me back to, to what you built, right? And what was that like going through that, that process, getting it up to speed, talking to investors? What were some of the feedback? I'm sure you probably got some no's, some yeses. What, what was that building process like? Yeah, so we, we started this in early 2017, and our first season was 2018. And we just completed our second season with the championship and New Year's Eve in 2019. And like very early on, whether you're building any new sports league, people are very skeptical because they think NFL – there's only one. We're all in the United States, so we think of there is only one dominant league. But if you really look, MMA is very much like soccer. There's nine soccer leagues around the world with revenues of over a billion. Not value, but revenues of over a billion. And the MMA audience is a lot like the soccer audience. That means there's 85% of them outside the United States. It's truly global. And it's really, really big in about 25 territories or countries. So MMA will evolve like soccer. MMA is only a 25-year-old sport. Second youngest sport after esports, yeah, yeah. right? Basketball is 75 years old. So I started telling investors and started telling business development partners and started telling employees that wanted to work for us, there's only one company so far, UFC. There's going to be a handful of very, very big companies. This is almost like when I went to AOL in 1997. If you were an early adopter, it was late. <laughs> if you were mass market, you didn't even have an email address yet. The internet was going to be very, very big. And there were going to be lots of winners. So in MMA, there's going to be a handful of billion-dollar companies. And there's one so far. And so that's the pitch we gave very early on. But obviously, we had to prove that. Could our product be as good? Would fighters want to be here? And would media want to distribute us? And that's what we've had to do over the last three years. How do you guys get to be the billion-dollar company? You guys have raised a lot, $100 million, So it's a lot of ambition there, right? It's, it's going to be from you know traditional venture capital. It probably needs to be a billion-dollar exit, depending on what your investors are looking for. So how does the PFL get to be that next billion-dollar MMA franchise? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, if you, if you just take a, a click up and think about any sports league for a minute, you need three things to be very, very successful. You need the best talent athletes. You need a really exciting product. And then there's got to be demand for it among fans and among media distribution partners. And all three of those exist right now in MMA, and PFL has tapped into those. Those three, in terms of excess demand, haven't existed since the ABA in the 1970s or the AFL in the 1970s, and I'll walk you through that. So these kind of supply-demand dynamics have not been favorable, except in MMA now. Well, what do I mean? So I'll start with fighters. There's 1,500 professional fighters around the world. That, I mean, at the highest, highest level, there's about 15,000 MMA, but 1,500 professionals. There's 500 in the UFC. So that means there's 1,000 of them that don't have a place to fight at the highest level. So this is like when Julius Irving didn't have a place to play basketball. Yes, he was playing, but he needed the ABA. Joe Namath, yes, he was playing, but he needed the AFL. Number two, 
our product is as high quality as the UFC today. The production on the screen, and in fact, we're more innovative. We launched a referee cam to take you inside the cage. We're the first to wire the cage. We call it the smart cage, which gives you fighter data and analytics. So when you see our product, it's not B level, A plus level. It took a lot of investment to do that. So those first things in terms of recruiting fighters, so the fights were as good and presenting the TV product, so it was as good, we did. And nobody had previously done that before. Then the second thing was, okay, demand. As I said, people want more MMA product. There's 300 million fans globally against 30 fights. And the third is the media. Bob Eigner has talked about how UFC is performing fantastically for Disney, whether it's ESPN Plus or ESPN. There's 15 other media companies. There's no other high-quality MMA around the world. So UFC, doing great. What other MMA is going to be available to the media companies? We were very fortunate that ESPN, this past year, after they paid $2 billion in terms of media rights for UFC, came to us and said, we think your product in year one is fantastic. We think your production is fantastic. We think your fights are very exciting. Let's do a media deal, and we'll pay you for that media deal. Which is not not very, you know... Never done. Yeah. Never Especially done. Especially for new, new leagues. Usually it's, hey, we'll just produce it. You know, we're not going to give you anything on top of that. So we were paid cash rights fees and put on primetime TV Thursday night. We just concluded that first season. We're going to be on ESPN for 2020, and then we'll go back to the media market. But there's clearly high demand among media for what we're doing. Our PFL championship had 3 million global viewers in 150 countries with 30 TV partners. There's also no demand internationally for new sports leagues. As you know, there's four or five new sports leagues out there that started. Yep. It might take them never to get globally. We're in 150 countries on TV. We're paid in 140 of those by those TV partners. So I think that's a very interesting dynamic where if you look back to the 70s and the supply and the dynamic, are there players available that's top quality? Do the fans want more product and does the media want to pay for it? Really, the ABA and the AFL were the last time that really existed. And now in MMA and the PFL has tapped into that. <clears throat> you talked about one of the three being media, and then you mentioned 2020. Obviously, it's going to be a big year for you guys. Third year going into the next round of media cycles. For you, is what does that look like as you prepare for basically a negotiation between the ESPNs of the world, the Foxes of the world, I mean, anything else that may come up? You know, how do you guys differentiate that product? So you're in front of what would be a lot of the big rights negotiations coming down the pipeline, whether it's the NFL or something like that, to where you guys can get as big of a pie. So these people aren't like, oh, maybe I'm not going to spend here because I'm saving up to try and get a bigger piece of, of this pie. Adam, great question. The PFL is a major sport on a minor budget. Those don't exist. You can have minor sports on a minor budget, and you can have major sports on a major budget. So we're producing at the PFL already 25% of the UFC audience. Think how insane that is. So the UFC's been around 25 years. We've been around two. The UFC's marketing budget's $150 million. Ours is zero. They're on ESPN on Saturday nights. We're on ESPN2 on Thursday nights. And we're already doing 25% of their TV audience. That's how good the product is and how differentiated it is and how much demand there is for MMA out there. And we're growing 25% a year for our worst fight, 95% a year for our best fight. So if you took all of our fights this year, we grew 50%, fastest growing sports league. So we're on our way, yet we're still extremely affordable, producing major engagement, major audience. This is my two dozenth company to build, right? So it's not my first rodeo. We're really proud of what we've done, but we're also very realistic. We want to deliver for our partners. We really appreciate what ESPN has done. We wouldn't be here. We want to stay with ESPN, and we are reasonable people. We'll be reasonable people for the rest of the market, too. And I think what we've delivered is a product that people are shocked by how good it is, an audience that is not only good but really growing fast. And I think there'll be demand for that in the market. What do you think has contributed to that 25% in two years of, of the UFC, that, that, you know, that comparison? Why, why this? Is it just because MMA is a more mature market and there's more interest in the sport and the UFC is, is, has brought – MMA up to a level like rising tides lift all boats? No question. I think what you said is totally true. I think, look, when um, there's always a point going back to the internet where everybody says the water's warm, right? And, and when ESPN and Disney kind of blessed MMA, you know, said this is a, now a mainstream endeavor, that certainly helped. 
You sent it to all your investors, every media partner. Hey, <laughs> look at this. this that's is a next. big deal. Yeah. I think that's a big deal. So I think that's certainly helped. Um, I think that's point one. I think point two is, although there's been um, probably hundreds of MMA companies around the world that have started and said they're going to be the next co-leader with UFC, nobody's come at it with a differentiated product. It's always been a me too product. Well, UFC's killing it. What they do, call it putting McGregor up against somebody in a one-off event, nobody does it better. We don't need any more of that. They're fantastic at it. What we did is come at it with the sports season format. We, we don't decide anything. We choose 72 fighters at the beginning of the year in six weight classes, 12 fighters in each weight class. Win in advance. Think of it as a giant March Madness meets yep. MMA. Well, nobody ever tried that. People have done like one night tournaments. Bellator tried five or six years ago. What PFL is is not a tournament. It's a sports season. You can start to follow those journeys of fighters. Sometimes the favorites lose. That happened to the Dodgers this year against the Nationals, right? Yeah. All right. So sometimes you have a perfect record and the favorite loses. And people go, oh, is PFL upset by that? Eh, happens in real sports, I right? I mean, UMSBC over Virginia, everyone talked about it right. forever. And so to me, the context as a sport fan, when I watch March Madness, I only know like three players. I know Zion and I know about, you know, I know Duke. I don't follow it all day long. And when you look at MMA fighters right now, we did some research. Most fans can only name five fighters. I know John Jones. I know Conor McGregor. I know this Khabib guy only because he wears a fuzzy hat. Right? <laughs> that, you know, Ronda Rousey, oh, wait, she's not, <clears throat> she retired. Five fighters is all people can name. Think of that. So most fighters they can't name, and there's no context. Why are they fighting? Where are they going? Where have they been? And the tagline at the PFL is, what do you fight for? You're fighting for something to build FOS, yeah. right? We're all fighting for something. And the fighters are just another version of that, whether it's love or ego or money or a better way or to pay for your kid's college. We're all fighting for something. And we all want a fair shot. We don't want politics. We don't want marketing. We don't want manipulation. And there's been a lot of that in fighting since the 1920s. Yeah. And so I think what fans have responded to is the authenticity, the transparency, and the meritocracy of the PFL. And I think that's why it's taken off. Awesome. And you mentioned in part of that, you compared it to the, the season to March Madness. Obviously, one big part of March Madness is the sports betting side of things. We've yeah. seen sports betting explode, Penn National getting into Barstool. Yes. Barstool even has a fighting property. Sports betting for the PFL, I know you guys have live betting stats. Or you're going to be integrating them into yep. the broadcast this year. How do you see that playing out? What does it look like for you guys as an operator, as someone who has media assets? What, how does sports betting intertwine, and where do you see it going? Yeah, my role is, um, you know, founding partner at Revolution. We had done a lot of investments, you know, on the gaming side. Um, Sport Radar, DraftKings. Um, and so been aware of how important the gaming is and the gambling is for a long time, really on the engagement. Um, so from the very beginning, what we did at PFL is say, what if you're starting a new sports league to be digital first, mobile first? That doesn't mean you're not going to be on TV. <laughs> that just means what would you build into the product? So it was very engaging if you were a digital mobile consumer. You were 30 years old and you're watching something on your phone and you're in India or Chicago. So one thing we did is we wired the cage. We call it the PFL Smart Cage. We work with the people who created the yellow line, SMT, mm -hmm. and we're the first to get full clearance from all the commissions to essentially put technology in the cage. We can't just do that. That's a regulatory. What that does is we collect the biometrics and all the data and all the statistics real time in the fight. We've displayed some of those this year. Heart rate, punch impact, distance traveled. These are the greatest athletes in the world. For example, the heart rate of a fighter in minute eight is greater than LeBron James in quarter four. Astounding. But we won't know that because most of us don't watch a lot of MMA. The pressure on a mat, we're all falling asleep because they're on the mat. That's like an F-150 tire on you. So the more we can start to display these analytics on TV, people go, huh, it's, MMA is kind of interesting. I, I didn't know that. That also becomes prop bets on the mobile phone as we get to 20 states and 30 states, and we get more consumers with real-time mobile gambling. So PFL has already enabled all the smart cage, and the data from it we 
called Cajunomics. That's already happening as a media property now. It will happen as a gambling property for the playoffs this year in October with a partner. So we're discussing it. You know, we will not make the book ourselves. We will make the data feeds available to partners. But I think it'll be very interesting because unlike the other sports, the fighters under contract, you know, with the PFL. So we don't need a collective bargaining agreement approval. We can make those decisions unilaterally. So at the PFL, we should be very innovative in offering simple products for people. We don't need to work with a consortium of people to get, negotiate what those products are to offer those. So my hope is that we can offer products earlier than a lot of people, simpler and more engaging than a lot of other sports leagues you know, come this fall. And what does the betting interface look like for you? I know you mentioned the mobile app. Like, how how do you find how do you see it integrating into it? And, and even too, a lot of it for most people, sports betting is education. So now it's not only are you teaching people how to bet, you're teaching them how to bet on an, what would be an entirely new sport. So what does even that look like too as you lead up to that? Because I'm sure that's probably a big component. In every business I've been involved in or I've built in my experience, simple, simple, simple drives engagement. People didn't know what they were going to do with email. Email your mom or your friends. Start there. Right. It, it, you had to say that for three years. That's why you would get online. People say, what would I do online? So here I think it's as simple as what's going to be the hardest punch in this round? That's a great prop bet. Everybody knows what a punch. What's going to be the fastest strike kick in this round? So I think what you'll see PFL do are things that are very simple. You will have one click button on this stuff, and it will be your on-screen interface that you're watching the fight. I think that's what's going to take off for a lot of people. I don't think it's the deep Bloomberg of data that everybody keeps talking about. Um, it will evolve to that 10 years from now. And also there's a lot of serious gamblers that will evolve. What we're trying to do is be a mass sports league, and we're also trying to bring new sports fans in. If you're a stick and ball fan, you watch basketball or baseball, and you haven't watched a lot of MMA – we want to welcome you in. So I think what we'll do will be very engaging, very simple, very intuitive. How do you welcome those casual fans in who may be you know, aware of UFC and what that product is or looking for another product, right? I mean, there's if you think about it, the amount of professional sports leagues in the U.S. is only increasing spring football, pr- premier lacrosse league. Like It's a true fight for, inten- uh, fight for attention. How are you guys landing that punch, I would say, in the fight for attention? No pun intended. That's great. Well, look, you got to have great distribution. We had a great partner with ESPN. Um, and you got to have a great product, and we've done that. But I think the main thing we've done is we've given those fans, if you're a football or hockey or basketball or baseball fan, the same format they know and love. Our season starts the week before Memorial Day. And it runs in the summer. So the regular season is May, June, July, and August, when there's not a lot going on. It's Thursday nights. There's not a lot going on. So if you love sports, Thursday nights in the summer – is PFL MMA night in America and globally. So the first thing is we picked a time that's very, very good for those fans, and they should check it out. The second thing is you can watch it on your mobile phone on ESPN+, Plus, or you could watch it on ESPN2. So it's super easy to get. There's no paywall, right? UFC is behind a big paywall now. So we made it accessible. Then the next thing we did is we said we made the rules super easy. We don't have any other crazy rules. It's MMA you know and love except it's called win in advance. We pick 72 fighters at the beginning of the year. We end up with six weight classes with two finalists on New Year's Eve fighting for championship. That's all you need to know. So everybody understands, if they're only a basketball fan, how that works. If they're only a baseball fan, how that works. And so we didn't have to educate them on anything new. Um, and I think what the young fans really like, because your fight for attention is really, you know, call it your – you're 18 to 35, most MMA fights end in 10 minutes. Fantastic. Yeah, right? in and out. You're in and out. Mm-hmm. Um, there's over 300 punches or strikes in 10 minutes. Wow, high action. Mm-hmm. Like if you've watched boxing, you'll fall asleep watching boxing again, right? This is high action. Because remember, MMA is made up of six disciplines, you know, jiu-jitsu and judo and wrestling and boxing. So I always think of it as like a, you know, the cobra against the alligator. So the striker against the, the wrestler. Who's going to win here? So you have very few undefeated fighters, a lot of upsets, 10 minutes or less, very digestible, very high action. 
So I think that's made it the fastest growing sport. MMA was up 13% average growth over the last five years. No other sports more than 3%. And I think that's, so we have one, good currents behind us, two, a really good product, and then three, I think we picked this the season format and this time frame that really works for a lot of sports fans. And I think you mentioned the, the positive currents, but it would be remiss to not even talk about the headwinds that could potentially come of this with everything around concussions and safety and kids and younger people getting away from the footballs of the world. I mean, we've seen it across the board, right? This is inherently a very dangerous sport for a participant. Do you find that you guys are going to be impacted by that as you go forward? And and, and from a value prop standpoint, right? Like, are people who are that 18 to 35 going to be like, "Mm, I don't know if I want my kids when I'm 20 or when I'm 30 and I have kids to watch something where people are beating their heads in? Yeah. This is a great question because, you know, back to... I saw a huge business opportunity in MMA. I didn't start this as an MMA fan. I become hugely passionate and a huge lover of the fighters and the sport three years into it. But when I started, these are the kind of questions I had. And when we went out to investors, and I mean, our investors include, you know, in entertainment, people like Mark Burnett and Jimmy Iovine, sports team owners like David Blitzer, Ted Leonsis, Mark Lerner. So call it the titans and moguls of the world. They all ask me these questions, right? So we had to do a lot of research, and we had to give them facts, not opinions. Number one, MMA has far less injuries, far less concussions, and far less damage than even football. Forget boxing, which is off the charts. Football. It's the data. Why is that? The gloves are very small and very light. You don't get a lot of hits to the head. Yeah. Um, in the hits of the head, you might get you know broken bone and you might get injuries, but most people are out 45 days. Most fighters would like to fight three times a year, and the long-term damage is very minimal that they've studied. Super interesting. So the analogy is a lot like hockey, where hockey looks really bad, and the guy skates out in the third period. You know, so for people who um, won't like hockey, they won't like MMA. Is there some you know is there some some action that you know occasionally go wow that's a blow? Absolutely. But is there a lot of long-term damage, which I separate from that? Surprisingly little and far, far, far less than football in any given season. Far, far less. And the second thing I'd say to you is on the participation, um, MMA is a top three sport in terms of participation in every country except the United States. Every major country except the United States. It's top five in the U.S. You know, among people under 21. But top three around the world. You know, they might like basketball. They might like soccer. But if you look anywhere, not only growing, but top three. So once again, we're very U.S.-centric, you know, as we think about it. Um, So if I were, you know, in boxing, very worried. If I were in football, very worried. But actually in the MMA, I was very surprised to to see the statistics um, and just how safe it was. And more than that, how respectful the athletes were. Because remember where they came up. 40% of them have a college degree. 30% 30% of them were in the Olympics. Nobody's been giving them anything. They've been paying their way, and you're not really a champion until your late 20s. So it's just a very respectful, very organized, very disciplined sport. You talk U.S. versus global. How do you prioritize each of those things, right? You have 160 markets, 150 yeah. markets. You mentioned you're getting paid in 140 of them. U.S. is one of those 140. What does that look like from your time or resources standpoint? Yeah. As you mentioned, it's third and growing, and in the U.S. it's fifth, and you know, yeah. it's just a it's an emerging sport emerging. here, but it's a it's a massive sport globally. So what does that look like for you guys? Yeah, PFL's mission is to be a global sports league. We want to be the sixth major global league after the NFL, NBA, NHL, and EPL. You know, we count that in that. Um, so unlike some sports leagues that are U.S.-centric, we're completely focused from day one on global. So we have fighters from 18 countries. Um, the flags are on their shorts. So did we bite off a lot from the beginning? Absolutely. Is that expensive and more difficult? For sure. For sure. Um, but are we already succeeding on that metric? Yes. Of those 3 million audience I mentioned on PFL 2019 championship, 400,000 were on ESPN2, which was record ratings. Fantastic. Compare that to the average UFC audience is 900,000. So our championship was 40% of the average UFC fight. But we did 2.5 million outside the U.S. We did more viewers in Russia where it was 2 in the morning than we did in the United States. Wow. So 
already we're a robust global league. We're really well known in a lot of territories in year two. So we're completely focused on the global side. And to your point of what do we do to do that? First of all, we had to have global talent, which we did. Um, we scout in about 18 countries. Um, number two, got to have global distribution. So um, everything you have to do to do that. So we broadcast in multiple languages. We do the flags on the shorts. We translate a lot of our social media. So all the things around distribution and content you have to do. And then number three, it has to start to be a priority in terms of expansion. So how do eventually you touch those fans and get closer to it? And we'll be announcing some stuff later this year. We announced the first thing called the PFL International Qualifier Series. Um, our CEO, Pete Murray, announced it last week. It's a chance for a real-world Rocky to win. So we're going to be in Australia, Abu Dhabi, Germany, and uh, Russia in March. Four events. And we have a tournament, just one night in those countries. And the winner of that tournament gets a contract, not like Dana White's Contender Series, to maybe sometime fight. You have a slot in the PFL in 2020. So it's a real-world Rocky slot. So think of this. We have 72 fighters. And if you're one of those 72, you, you have got a shot. You got shot. So we call it the PFL International Qualifier Series. There's only four slots this year, one in each of those countries. Um, in each of those countries, we just picked one weight class. You know, so it's only four fighters. So we announced that, and that's a way for us to start to touch. But later this year, we're also going to announce some also interesting stuff where we're going to start to expand internationally starting in 2021, you know, that we haven't before. Um, but we've seen that UFC has taken some events internationally, like of their 30 events, 10 of them they take internationally, and they do extremely well. There's other international expansion available, and we're going to be looking at that. Why those four countries? Um, there's about eight countries where the MMA audience and the MMA fighter talent is A-level. Those are four of the eight. Four um, of the eight. So if you start to think about Mexico, Brazil, Europe, um, you would add those to the mix. China, Far East, you would add those to the mix. So we just started with four. We'll expand that to eight next year. For you, obviously, this has been a, a project of yours for the last three years. Like you yeah. said, it's not your first rodeo. There's obviously a lot of ups and a lot of, a lot of downs. We'd love to touch on the downs sure. and, and, the, and the struggles and the challenges you guys have faced as an emerging sports league because – at the end of the day, not it's not all roses and flowers. We wish it was, right? Yes. It would make it a lot easier. Well, you know, you're yeah, building a course, company. Of course, yeah. you wish it was. Yeah. But for you guys, what have been some of those those challenges that have either, you know, hey, I, we're not doing this, but maybe let's tweak it a little bit and do this instead. And, oh, okay, that works. But what yeah. does that look like for, for you as an operator and someone who's, who's done this before and, and really not this type of environment, but kind of other environments? Totally great question. Look, it, my dad's 90, and I still talk to him every day. He's super sharp. And as he says, are we going to start a are we going to start a seniors division yeah, in the yeah. PFL? <laughs> and uh, as my dad says, look, you know, if it was easy, everybody would do it. Yeah. So you know, as an entrepreneur, 100%. Um, I would probably list three really main challenges, and and this would be no different than if you read Howard Schultz, Starbuck, or Phil Knight. You go out of business four or five times, yep, and, and then you get to talk about success. If any one of those four or five times you do go out of business. You don't get to tell the story. Right? Yeah, right? exactly. That's exactly. how it is, right? right? So anybody that's made it has been through the same thing. Yeah. Every you know overnight success story is ten years in the making. Right? That's correct. You know, Guns and Roses was playing in the whiskey bar for five years, and then there's you know the big album. Yeah. You know, where'd you come from overnight, right? So I would list maybe three things that have been challenging for us to date. And by the way, there'll be more challenges. One hundred percent. There'll be more challenges. Um, the first thing is raising capital. Raising, and at the gap, at the level you guys raise capital. Not, that's not a joke. Correct. Um, we knew that if we didn't have the great fighters and a great product, you're not going to build a great sports league or a great media company. You're not going to do it. And the biggest failure of almost everybody over the last two decades that wants to build a great media company is not having a great product. That costs money, and that costs money before you have a lot of revenue. So you have to be able to raise capital. And if you look at UFC, they had a single source of capital, single source, funded, you know, close to $80 million from one family. So they didn't have to do that. And by the way, that was 15 years ago. What's 80 million today? 160? Yeah. Okay. 
Well, we didn't have one family giving us $160 million. So you have to convince people in that vision in a, in, in a, in a very authentic way because we we're convincing investors who are serious because we also wanted their help, right? So that was a challenge, no question. Second challenge is you've got to get A-plus distribution. We were on NBC Sports Network the first year, and we appreciated being on there, but they didn't give us very much promotion. And they didn't give us any ancillary time to put on like the road to PFL or the selection show or the highlight show or, or, re, or re-airing two or three times our events. The kind of things that ESPN has nicely done for us, you know, to help build that property. Um, but they put us on air. Nobody else is willing to put us on air, right? Yeah. I'm without paying for yeah, it, of course, right? Of course. Without paying for it. And then ESPN gave us a nice contract in the second year. So we're really in- indebted to both those people. But we also worked hard to get both those deals. But without that, but neither one was easy. Yeah, of course. Right? And you worry about you worry about that all the time. And even people who own their own traditional sports teams, if you're not the NFL, you're always negotiating with your media partners. And it's very stressful on the distribution and content, give and take. That's permanently a tug of war. Um, and it's also um, for a little company, we don't have any power, right? Yeah. We're trying to put out a great product and we're trying to, to have a win-win. But we don't have any power. We're not the NHL. And they have the least power, right? Yeah. Right? Um, so I, I think how do you get great distribution on fair terms that allow you to even raise money and build that league, I think, was that second challenge. And, and then the third thing was we keep trying to refine the product. What's really interesting to fans? So one thing we're going to do this year is we've always had this um, – the one with the most points in the regular season is the number one seed. And they're against the number eight seed. So we took that straight from any seeding you'd ever have. Yep. March Madness. Is that really fair? Just like MLB sometimes this week might rethink its playoffs, the NBA sometimes rethinking how to make this. We said, what if that number one seed, they've really earned it. They should be able to maybe pick their opponent. So I think you're going to see this year, you know, in the PFL, the number one seed calling out who they want to fight from the other seven. They've earned that. They got the most points. So you're going to still have the other seven in there, but they should be able to call out who they want to do. That creates better rivalries, and maybe they think the number five seed on points is weaker than the number eight, and they want to do that. So we're going to constantly refine within that meritocracy and transparency how that product is not only more interesting for fans, but draws a bigger audience, draws more engagement. You mentioned the EPL as a, a league you kind of benchmark yourself against. Is there a PFL 2 and there's promotion and relegation at some point? Is there, you know, global PFLs where it's, you know, PFL Australia, PFL Abu Dhabi, and they have those leagues, and then you have a, a Champions League type of thing, right? Like, is, is, what do you guys kind of see as this roadmap is, you know, you raise $100 million, the roadmap to a billion in terms of probably what your exit would like to be. What does that next five years look like? You can come do business development with us at any time. I'd be glad to have you. Um, but look, you, you've, you've basically read what we're working on. You know, the opportunity here, obviously, is to create a FIFA of MMA. And countries want their own league. They don't want you to give them one fight a year. That's exporting what they view as an American product. What we have built is PFL Global, But yes, just like the Olympics can't exist without American TV, it's very Americanized. Yeah. So what if we really, really built a global league and we really gave major territories their own PFL Europe? Something that we're actively working on. Along with that, I think you'll see in 2028, MMA in the Olympics. A lot of discussion on that. Five of the six disciplines that make them MMA are already in the Olympics, but they don't have like the, the viewer cachet of yeah. putting MMA in the Olympics. I think they'll adopt something very similar to the PFL format in terms of points. Remember in the PFL, you get a win, you get three points, but you also get bonus points for early finish. So 
Adam knocks out Don, Don in the first round, you get three points. You knock me out in the second round, two points, the third round, one point. What that does is that incentivizes early finishes. So I think you're going to see the Olympics start to shape your question about the globalization of MMA, the format of MMA, countries and pride around MMA, and the PFL is going to try to be a leader in that. And I think we have the flexibility to partner with people to do that. What was that moment, you know, you raised the first time $50 million, you start the league. What was that moment when you said, you know what, shit, this can actually be something. You know, like that was, there was like a seminal moment where you're like, damn, you know, I was, I was right about this. Let's, let's go all in and, and raise the next round and let's really kind of like put our foot to the metal here and try and see if we can actually like take advantage of what is an upswell. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if that exact, I understand your question, yeah. but I don't think that moment always exists because maybe, you know, look, I'm 57 years old and so... That first money I take, I have such a sense of uh, commitment and responsibility yep. that I felt that right away, in a sense. Um, but I co-founded the league, and I was also running Revolution. At the same time, I did two jobs, um, you know, as we all some, sometimes do. Yeah. Um, but early in 2018, you know, after we put on a couple events, I saw the opportunity to make this not a billion-dollar company, but a co-leader in MMA. And I went to my partners at Revolution, Steve Case and Ted Leonsis. And I said, look, I've been a venture capitalist last dozen years, you know, running our revolution funds. I have to go in and try to build this PFL and everything it can be. You know, and so now I went to founding partner Revolution as of the end of, you know, 2018. So I'm full-time PFL. Yeah. So I think to your question, you know, as an entrepreneur, sometimes you say, A, this can be really big and impactful, but two, um, I have to give it everything I got to do that. I have a, we have an unbelievable team. I mean, Pete Murray, the CEO, uh, former head of marketing of Under Armour, 13-year senior executive of the NFL, George Greenberg, our executive producer, 16 sports Emmys, was top producer at the NFL and, and UFC for Fox. Um, Jim Branson, our head of business development, business affairs, general counsel, general counsel at AOL. So unbelievable team. But as an entrepreneur, big idea, big opportunity, got to go all in. And so I think I felt that very early. Um, but as you also know, every day you're pretty nauseous. Yeah, right. <laughs> Tell me about it. Every day you're pretty, every day. Every day you're pretty nauseous yeah. because in a sense, um, there is no end. No. You know, and, and every day you have to be optimistic, glass yep. half full. Yep. Because the glass is never more than half full. I don't care where you are. Never. <laughs> never more than half full. Never. So, you know, you mentioned there is no end, but what is the horizon, right? You know, obviously UFC sold to Endeavor. Is, is that the move? You know, you don't have to give me the secret sauce, but, you know, how do you guys see this kind of matriculating? What is, I mean, I'm sure you've probably even entertained those conversations already just based off of the market and what's going on and the, and the economy, right? It's a good time to be building something that at least is providing value. What is it that you see as, as, that, as that success story for, for you guys, for the investors, and, and really what would be the quote-unquote end point? Yeah, no, actually, to be blunt, we haven't thought about it because we have too much to build. Yeah. You know, we have, we have too much ahead of us to yeah. build. Everything we just talked about, yeah. you know, for the last half hour, we got ahead of us to build. Um, so um, are we trying to build something very valuable? For sure. But we got so much work to do. And so the work is how do you build the brand? How do you build the audience? How do you go global? And how do we deliver for our partners? And, and that's – we got a couple years to do that. 2020, you know, third year for you guys. When you look back, you're sitting in there New Year's Eve at the end of 2020 – what makes 2020 a success for, for PFL, and, and where do you think that you guys can take leaps and bounds from, from what even just what you had the success from 2019? Yeah, it's a great question. Look, PFL has to be culturally relevant. Sports is in the fabric of, you know, of all of us. So when you talk about sport, whether it's the NBA championship or whether it's March Madness, it's culturally relevant. And some people are talking about the PFL championship, but we need more. <laughs> Right. Some people are talking about our sports season format, and it's really, really cool. And a lot of people on Reddit, we need more, right? Um, so we need to do um, a host of things to make PFL culturally relevant, you know, in, in that combat sports community, right? And, and that will be all around the product continuing to be exciting and innovative. That will be all around unique promotion. Stuff we're working on with Mike Tyson will be great. It'll be all around our expansion internationally, you know, which is really starting to activate these countries. Um, it'll be all around some of the new stuff we're doing with the Cajunomics and, 
and the gaming and the gamification, all this kind of stuff will make people say, hey, have you checked out the PFL yet? Because the one thing we know is anybody who's checked it out, they don't stop watching it. This is not like it wasn't good, wasn't interesting, it wasn't differentiated. They say it was good, it was interesting, it was differentiated. So that cultural relevance, I'm sure you know as an entrepreneur, people say, front office sports, I heard of that. Okay, well, that's a big moment. Yeah. And the number of people, we were down doing business at the Super Bowl, the number of people who said, I saw that on New Year's Eve, that was unbelievable. It was 10X the year before, can it be 10X again? I think that's the kind of stuff we drive toward. In terms of the metrics, our audience increased 50% year over year. We got to increase it 50% again. Our engagement was 200% year over year. Got to do 200% again. So you got all those, you know, our revenue increased uh, 400%. Got to do 400% again. So those are the kind of metrics underneath your, yeah. your squishiness of yeah. um, cultural relevance. But you need that kind of discussion among combat sports fans. You talk about revenue. What's the uh, what's the path to profitability? I'm assuming it's it's not there yet. But for you guys, what is what is that path? And and do you? I mean, I'm assuming you hopefully have that built into the business yeah. model. Uh, what what does it look like to get to there? Yeah. No. It, look, it's it's surprisingly close. Look, this uh, MMA is not that expensive. Yeah. Very expensive as a startup. We have raised a hundred million dollars, but in the scheme of building a very big company, um, uh, to put on a great product, we can be break even on our next media deal. Wow. You know, so we can be break even in 2021, 2022 at the very latest. Um, so we'd be break even in our fifth year. It's um, pretty good. It's pretty good. Yeah. Um, so it just depends on once again, you know, uh, back to revolution. You know, in our last 15 years, we built a lot of big companies. Building a big company takes a lot of capital. This is a big amount of capital, but in the scope of what we're building, reasonable. And I think in the fifth year of operations to be break even on that big a scope, you know, I, that's, that's, that's a great business model. I think what's pretty interesting underneath that, though, is if you look at MMA as a business versus sport as a business, right? Yeah. You know, I started my career, you know, as a chief negotiator for the Chicago Cubs. You know, I did Sammy Sosa's first contract and Mark Grace's first contract. Mark Grace, former Diamondback. Remember those days? Yeah, oh, I yeah. did. And I still, my favorite piece of memorabilia, because Mark Grace was my first deal, is he sent me a bat, and it said $4.4 4 I gave you a break with you underlined. <laughs> and that was a lot. I love that. That was, a lot, that. That, that was a lot for a first baseman who yeah. had no power back then. You know, this is 1992, right? Wow. Um, so I still love my Mark Grace bat. But um, So if you look at sport, and then you look at MMA, um, the compensation in MMA, PFL, is paying twice what the UFC is paying in terms of fighter compensation, in terms of revenue. But it's still less than half of what the other athletes get in the other sports. So MMA can be profitable where most sports are break even at best, unless you're in a big market, you know, LA and New York, right? You know, just these sports teams just do not produce a ton of cash unless you're in a big market where MMA can be highly profitable. It's pretty interesting. Um, and, and also, we don't have a building. We don't have a big field. You know, when you start to look at the CapEx or the capital assets yep. around MMA, relatively light, asset light versus, you know, sport team. So I think the economics of building an MMA league, you know, are very favorable. And then the third thing is global versus U.S. centric. So those are three differences, the athlete compensation piece. Um, paying them very, very well still allows you to have reasonable compensation and the asset light and then the global revenue streams make this a good business if you can get to scale. Um, and so I think that's why we've been very aggressive trying to build an A-plus product um, be because those drivers are there. And you say asset light, and, and it's great in that sense, but it also kind of probably hurts you from a partnership standpoint. You're not selling in-building signage. You're not selling this. You know, you have a product that's that's on the road, that's going places, these partners are, are buying into probably a little bit different, and, and you probably knew as a someone who was signing contracts and, and working on everything with the Cubs of what these deals were looking like. Even then, now it's probably very different for the, the president days of the world and a lot of these other partners that you guys have working with. What's that pitch? It's, it's interesting. It's a great pitch, but think of it as the Olympics pitch versus a event pitch. So you can integrate your brand for the entire season in any way you want. Because remember, back to the athletes are under contract. We own all the intellectual property. We centrally control the league. There are no teams that we have to deal with. 
So if, if you're Geico or your Presidente, Anheuser-Busch, sponsors of ours, um, how would you like the athletes to activate? We can create modules on TV or in stream, in social, in digital, throughout the season, over the 10 events. We can create custom campaigns because all that intellectual property is owned and centrally controlled. So you're not dealing with a league, a team, and a star player. All three of those are the same. So we can create custom campaigns and integrate them like never before. And also we do our own TV production, not just our own social and digital, our own TV production. So it's not just the ancillary content, but it's the main feed. So that allows you to do things that other leagues cannot do and do so at a very reasonable price. So what you give up is, call it event activation, yeah. <clears throat> um, but you have global media activation that they can't buy elsewhere, and that's pretty interesting. You've been around the block, right? You've, you've done it all. You've multiple businesses started and exited. What has been like the last three years, and just, just personally for you and, and this experience, diving into to building what would be a sports league and, and taking this risk that's a little bit different than what you've done in the past, what has this been like for Dawn and, and, yeah. and, and, and just yeah. like the career and just like the excitement and the energy and the opportunity that this has provided you? <clears throat> to me, I like, look, a lot of my business partners or friends said, what are you doing? I'm sure. What are you doing? Yeah. Right? Good career. Now you're saying, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, look, good career, comfortable, things are going well. What are you doing? Um, and, and for Most me- Most 50-plus somethings don't yeah, start a sports league. Yeah. And- um, and look, for me, it, it, it's like riding a roller coaster, right? And, yeah. and, and everybody who's been out there, I grew up in Cincinnati, and my first job was at Kings Island Amusement Park when they built the Beast that summer. Love I it. worked there. I love the Beast. Longest, baddest, fastest wood roller coaster still in the world. Great. But riding a roller coaster, that first time you've ridden a, a, a new big roller coaster, Scary. I had to have someone pull me on to the roller coaster the first time I did it. Scary. But ever by the end of that day, I was head first flying on an upside down roller coaster. Great, right? But scary. Little anxiety, right? You go up, click, 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 click. And the last thing you think about before you go over that first drop, that 250 foot first drop, if it's the diamond back or wherever you're at, you go, what am I doing on this coaster, right? <laughs> And then you make it through that first hill. You didn't go off the track. You didn't die. You didn't throw up. Yep. And you go, this is great. I'm glad I did this. Right? Yep. Everybody else is watching like a movie. And I'm on this coaster. It's, great. it's fine they're watching a movie. That's legit entertainment. 100%. Whatever the analogy to a movie is and work. Yep. Right? But I'm doing this coaster. So yes, when you go up that hill... You question why you're doing it. Yes, when you go down that first hill, you're worried you're going to die, throw up, or right, the coaster's going to break, yeah. right? That's, as you know, as an entrepreneur, what, you know, so I've had those moments for th the last three years. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, you're glad you ride that coaster, you know, and, and you're glad you took an idea in your head and said, I'm not backing down from that idea. I'm doing it. 